Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the second reading of the semester in the Southwest Minnesota State University Visiting Writers Series. I am Marianne Murphy Zarzana and I serve as the director of the Creative Writing Program here. Please take a moment now to turn off your cell phones. Tonight I'm delighted to welcome South Dakota writer Mary Haug, who will read from her new book, a memoir entitled Daughters of the Grasslands Through the Looking Glass of South Korea published this year by Bottom Dog Press. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A, and you may purchase Mary's book outside and have her sign it. Mary grew up on the grasslands west of the Missouri River in South Dakota, the middle child of a bohemian father from whom she inherited her gypsy spirit and an Irish mother who offered the security of home. She likes to write about her childhood and the ways in which family, church, and land have shaped her. This book began during her time as an exchange professor at Chung Nam National University in Taejeon, South Korea. That experience sparked memories of South Dakota. When she witnessed an ancestor veneration ceremony, she remembered a prairie cemetery near her childhood farm. At the public baths, she recalled her mother naked and shivering in a nursing home. Standing at the DMZ, she recalled a pond in a patch of grassland, now plowed and planted with sorghum. Daniel Lehman, co-editor of River Teeth, a journal of nonfiction narrative, in a review of Mary's book writes, Mary Worcester Haug offers a lovely, ruminative book transcending usual boundaries of memoir and travel writing. She evokes the intoxications of boiled silkworm, blood sausage, and Korean kimchi. These appear amid wafting tugs of childhood illness, a sometimes over-anxious mother, and the magic of a childhood in Lakota country. Mary has published in national and regional magazines, as well as literary journals and news magazines. Her essay about visiting the Korean baths, which is included in this book, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Mary taught English for 30 years at South Dakota State University, and when she retired, she lived in the Badlands National Park in interior South Dakota for five weeks, serving as a writer in residence. She and her husband, Ken, live in Brookings, South Dakota. As a member of a creative nonfiction writing group with Mary, I have been privileged to read and critique Mary's memoir in draft stages over the past couple years. Now, it is a great joy for me to read her printed words to hold her beautiful book in my hands and to share it with others. Please give a warm welcome to Mary. Thank you. I rarely use a microphone because I have a really loud teacher's voice. Is this at the right level? Up, down, is it okay? It's kind of bothering me. <laughs> um, the, piece I'm, the chapter I'm going to read tonight came from our experience. My, my husband and I lived in Taejeon, South Korea, where I, I taught. And um, we took a tour up to the, a USO tour up to the DMZ, um, up to the border of North and South Korea. And I, I thought I was writing one kind of chapter, and it, it sort of evolved over time into a very, very different uh, look at the DMZ and a very different understanding of what it meant to stand at that border. Um, it was a totally surreal experience. I kept wondering, why, why are they taking us up here? And why am I going? <laughs> but I'm glad I did it. It's one of those things I'm very happy I did. But it's just so strange to stand at a border and see armed guards and know that there's something like a million soldiers standing along that fence that divides North and South Korea. I want to say just a little bit about the USO tour before I read the chapter. Um, I think part of the reason I was drawn to go to the border was a MASH episode, and perhaps some of you remember this, where Hawkeye gets in a jeep and drives up to Panmunjom and walks into the Military Armistice Commission building where the negotiators have been sitting around a wooden table for months arguing over who owns more inches of land beneath the table. And he chews them out and says, I'm, you know, young men are, are dying and you're arguing about whether one side has 12 inches and the other has 11 inches under this table. Also, I grew up in the shadow of the Cold War, the 1950s, and so there were p memories of that that I sort of, um, was sort of haunted me, I guess. 
We began the tour at Camp Casey in Seoul, which um, is just down the hill from the, military the U.S. military base in Itaewon. We went up along the East Sea, the coastline, and the closer we got to the border, the more we began to see signs um, out in the fields or out in the, the grasses that said, that warned us of landmines. And we later found out in the 2011, I asked the guide, Will, who was um, a young military man, you know, any of these landmines ever go off? He said, no, only when a deer steps on them once in a while. But in 2001, they had them during the monsoon season, I'm sorry, 2011, during the monsoon season, heavy rains caused landslides around southern Seoul and they dislodged several mines. So they're still active mines, but they were able to defuse them. We stopped first, our first checkpoint, we went through several military checkpoints where there were wooden guard houses and then they would come on the bus and check our passports and go through our bags and things like that. Um, and that's where we met Will, who was the young man who spent the day with us on the bus. 40,000 American troops are still stationed in, around 40,000 in South Korea, but only a handful of American troops serve at the border, which I was not aware of. I thought a lot of our troops were stationed up there, but, but he said, no, there are very few of them. And it's actually, um, Will had to be among the elite in the army if he got a post at the border, and it's a pathway to promotion for young military men. He gave us a lot of instructions. We couldn't point, laugh, or make faces at the guards as if any of us would. I would think we wouldn't be that dumb, but who knows. We couldn't have on muscle, sh muscle shirts or shorts, so I had to go change. Um, <laughs> and he, the reason he said, if you show up looking sloppy, um, Korea, North Koreans will use it as propaganda to say that Americans are an inferior person. We also couldn't wave at the guards because they said wave, people waving would be a signal to the North Korean guards that we wanted to defect that we wanted to get out of, out of um, South Korea or the United States and come over and live there, which we all want to do, I suppose. And we had to sign a waiver that read, the visit to the joint security area of Panmunjom will entail entry into a hostile area and the possibility of death as a, di di as a direct result of enemy action. And you know, even though I signed that, I still wasn't concerned. I, I thought, we're perfectly safe. And, I, and we were, I'm here to tell it. Um, at Camp Boniface, there was a golf hole that had been on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine, which called it the most dangerous golf course. And then a sign that near the course, or near the hole read, danger, do not retrieve balls from rough line, live minefields. There was a gift shop at Camp Boniface selling coffee mugs, golf balls, baseball caps, books, and camouflage for children. It was just weird. We're in a war zone. There's a gift shop. We saw, we went down one of the tunnels. There's a network of four tunnels that run under the border. And um, well, they're certain that North Koreans have built those tunnels, they deny it, but the direction of the tunnels is all leading into Seoul, so they're quite certain that it's, um, they were dug by the North Koreans. And one tunnel is large enough to allow 30,000 troops to pass through in an hour, so it's their mean business. And it's 73 feet underground, and we walked down at an angle about like this, and then once we reach level, we walked for a few yards, and then there's a brick wall where the border is. So the border is deep and underground as well above ground. When we came back up, they diverted us through a, a gift shop. <laughs> um, we saw the Bridge of No Return, where the, I'll write about that in this chapter, where they exchanged the prisoners at the end of the war. The Boniface Memorial, and I'll write about that. I write about that. There are two villages on either side of the border. Daesongdong is a village on the south side, and a, the number of South Korean families live there who grew up on those lands, and after the war they were able to come back and farm. Um, they have voting rights. They're exempt from military service. They farm 17 acres, which is five times the average farm size in South Korea, 17 acres. Uh, and they live in government-built housing with high-speed access, internet access. They farm under an armed guard to protect them from the North Koreans. And they have a curfew, and if they're ever out after curfew, they could be shot by their own side. And King Jong Dong is the village on the north side of the border. And according to Will, those buildings are just fronts. No, there are no, there's nothing behind them. They run buses back and forth every day saying that they're busing happy workers to work, but he claims there are no, no passengers in the bus. So, um, and they have loudspeaker over there that plays a song all day long with the, the lyrics, today the world is constantly envious of the North Korean people. And then we made it to Panmunjom, which is where I wanted to go, and that's right in the center of the DMZ, the joint security area. And we stood at the border and Will told us that this two-level tower that we could see over to our right, we were being watched by North Korean soldiers through binoculars and they were taking our pictures. And then just across the border, about as far as that front row of chairs from us, 
was what the North Koreans claim is a recreation center. But according to Will, it's a surveillance operation. And he said, if there's soldiers in there, they have their weapons pointed at us, at us right now. Um, I did get inside the Military Armistice Commission building to see the table. A massive rock Republic of Korea soldier was, stood at the end of the table. Um, to serve at the border, if you're Korean, South Korean, you must be at least six feet tall, you must speak fluent English, and you must have the skills of a Navy SEAL. So they are the elite of the, North, of the South Korean Army. The North Korean soldiers, and we were very close to one with his rifle over his shoulder, he was just tiny, and tiny and malnourished looking. So at the end of the day, one of the things I realized about why they took us up there, I mean, think about this. Here's this here are these North Korean soldiers who are told that every place else in the world is poorer than North Korea, that they have it better than any other country in the world. And the USO, the United States, drives cheerful, well-fed, well-dressed Westerners with cameras hanging on, around our necks and cell phones and on all those sorts of things. We were propaganda. And I realized that um, on the way home. I thought, that's what it is. We're propaganda for the United States. And, and maybe that's good. Maybe North Koreans need to see, have a glimpse of the lies they're being told. So this is the chapter that evolved out of that day. I'm traveling up the coastline of the East Sea on my way to the narrow spit of land that divides North and South Korea. The air is moist and redolent of salt and kelp, and the surf crashes over anti-tank barriers that spin over the beach like stars. Or maybe they are asterisks on the pages of Korean history that speak of victorious battles for inches of land but make footnotes of displaced civilians, villages reduced to rubble, and families separated by a border. Artillery tubes peek through the branches of poplar and pine trees that blanket the hills. Watchtowers with searchlights balance on stilts like egrets fishing the streams. I imagine guards, are they North Korean or United Nations forces, looking through binoculars at a busload of tourists driving up for Unification Road toward the border. At several checkpoints, concrete barriers protect wooden guardhouses with roofs that sweep up like winged headpieces on Polish nuns. Heavily armed South Korean soldiers walk down the aisle of our bus, inspecting our passports. The landscape of South Dakota, too, is littered with the refuse of war. Broken treaties, borders, and sorrows written in places like Wounded Knee Creek, a narrow stream that rambles through the southwest corner of the state. Greed was the cartographer that drew lines that divided the land. Cultural genocide was the truth omitted from my history books. And an old Lakota woman was once an asterisk in my diary. I'm not certain why I make this journey. Perhaps I want to see the last vestige of the Cold War that dominated my childhood. The missile silos buried in the grasslands west of our land, bomb shelters in the basements of my school and church and mushroom clouds that brought my mother to my bedside to wake me from my nightmares. If the Cold War has ended for me, it has shadowed the lives of Koreans since 1953, when the Korean War fizzled to an inconclusive end. 160 miles of fence and razor wire are an ugly gash, divide the, are an ugly gash dividing the peninsula and dividing families and a common people. Maybe I am drawn by something Jung Hoon, my colleague at Chungnam National University, said. The border makes us a melancholy people who cover our Han, our suffering with laughter. Then he laughed. Perhaps I make the journey because I know what it means to stand at the thin line between laughter and sorrow. The bus turns off the main highway and lumbers down an isolated road. White signs hang at regular intervals on the chain link fence. Do not come close, warn the red Hongo characters. Reminders that encroaching upon the no man's land that separates North and South Korea could ignite the embers of war that still smolder beneath an uneasy truce. They recall hand-painted signs on barnward nailed to fence posts along the gravel roads in South Dakota, warning no trespassing. I was familiar with the word trespassing. We said it every day in our home when I was growing up. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For me, sin was entangled with crossing lines, and the progression of sin was measured by lines the nun drew on the blackboard. If you cross that first line, she cautioned, it becomes easier to cross the next line and the next and then the next. She punched the lines with a piece of chalk, raising shimmering swirls of chalk dust that drifted across the room. 
until finally, she said, looking over her wire rim glasses, your soul is covered in black spots of sin. I imagined pepper on mashed potatoes. Brown birds huddle on bushes in an open meadow. They startle at the rumbling of the bus, scatter like buckshot, and fly toward North Korea. Their wings are brush strokes on a parchment of sky and bring to mind scalloped edges on boots, the leather ruffled with wear, the soles not much longer than a baby bird. I was in high school the day Mrs. Thompson, a member of the Crow Creek tribe, stopped my mother, the boots in her hand, and said, Please give these to Mary Alice. I wore these boots when I was a baby, and I'd like to give them to her because she's so nice to me. The gift bothered me because I knew I hadn't earned it. I smiled and said hello when we passed by one another on Main Street, but I scurried past her, never stopping to talk, but feeling her soft eyes following me. I didn't use the racist language some of my classmates did. We never used it in our home. So the first time I heard someone use derogatory terms for Indians, I felt a twist in my stomach, like the day I played spin the bottle in the barn with my cousins when I was a little girl. The barn smelled of manure and the dust of oats and feed troughs. Behind me, a pinto pony nickered and pawed its straw in its stall. I don't know why I believed kissing was sinful, but I was sick at the thought of pressing my lips against a boy's. I imagined myself jumping on the pony's back, clasping his mane, and galloping away. But I wasn't brave enough to be a trick rider, nor was I brave enough to stop the game. I sat on my heels on the packed dirt floor, my stomach churning, as I watched a bottle spin, stop, and point at a boy. As I walked toward him through bars of light shining through cracks in barnwood, I was crossing a line like the one the nun drew on the board between the sin of omission, doing evil, doing nothing to stop evil, and the sin of commission, doing evil. I lay in bed that night watching the clouds move over the stars, sick to my stomach. I crept into my parents' dark bedroom, knelt by their bed, and woke my mother. I wasn't afraid that she would spank me. She had never laid her hand on me. But I dreaded the look on her face, anger in the slight tightening of her lips, disappointment in her eyes growing dark. Mommy, I whispered, I did a bad thing today. I kissed a boy. She wiped my tears with soft fingers and said, don't be silly. You're too young to have committed a sin. But when something makes you feel ashamed, you should not do that thing. <clears throat> At first, I hid Mrs. Thompson's boots on the top of my dresser behind perfume bottles, a lacquered music box that played over the rainbow, and several framed pictures of my friends. But the boots demanded my attention. So I slipped them into a drawer along with my diary and a sachet of rose petals tied in a pocket of lace. Sometimes I took them out and ran my fingers over the worn leather hearing Mrs. Thompson's words to my mother, your daughter is a good girl. But I wasn't good. Despite the queasy feeling in my stomach, I didn't confront my friends when they used racial slurs. I didn't, I didn't question the stories they repeated about reservation people. I laughed at their jokes. I have learned that Buddha taught that Ipiseyana is a way of knowing through observing something so closely that the differences between the observer and the observed disappear and barriers give way. Over time, however, I began to believe the stories my friends told of how I differed from reservation people. I built a border between myself and my Indian neighbors, one stereotype and one joke at a time. There is a poplar tree along an isolated road in the demilitarized zone. Someone has lopped off the top of the tree. Fire has stripped the branches of leaves and left scorch marks on the trunk. A brass plaque on a concrete base webbed with cracks sits near the tree. It marks the site where several South Korean civilians and unarmed American GIs were attacked by axe-wielding North Korean soldiers. That was August 18, 1976. Captain Arthur Boniface and First Lieutenant Mark Barrett died that day. They are among 90 other Americans who have perished in the more than 30 skirmishes that have broken out along the border since demarcation. Now troops on both sides of the border live in a state of readiness for war. How is it that I have never heard of these deaths? that I know so little about the Korean War and its aftermath. The bus shudders with the engines idling and the smell of diesel filters through a crack in the window. I feel nauseated from the motion, the thick odor of fumes, and savage images of steel slicing through flesh. A man holds a camcorder to the window. For some reason, I am offended by his videotaping this place, as if he crosses a boundary I can't define. Then a memory tugs at me. 
I'm standing outside the Wounded Knee Cemetery waiting for the smudging ceremony to begin. A woman scans the scene with a camcorder. A native man walks over to her and puts his hand over the lens. She puts the camera away. Then another memory comes of a sepia-toned photo of bodies wrapped in tray blankets and stacked on the lip of a trench dug in the bloodied ground of Wounded Knee. The carnage of Wounded Knee began in the fear of Revolka, a prophet who taught a dance that promised the people would reclaim their land and be reunited. He said the tribes would once again follow the buffalo as they had for centuries. There were rumors that he encouraged uprisings. So when a man at a nearby agency saw the flames and smoke from Chief Spotted Elk's camp, he telegraphed for military support. That was December 1890. Although the massacre happened just a few hours west of my childhood farm, I didn't know for years that the warriors dancing and singing that night were unarmed, that there were no war songs, and that a white flag flew above the council teepee, that mostly unarmed old men, women, and children, not warriors, died that day. These facts were tucked among stories of the cavalry's victorious battle in my history books as asterisks. When I see the sign for Pan Moon Jam, the military complex in the heart of the Joint Security Area, my stomach knots with an edginess I once felt when I drove on to the reservations that bordered our land. My high school friends often warned me about crossing the reservation line. Indians don't like white people and they will beat you up if you go on the reservation, the girls said as we drove by the saloon on Main Street. They didn't talk about how later that night police would break up fights in the alley between cowboys. You might get killed by a drunk driver, the boys warned as we sped down gravel roads that led to river bottom keg parties. I wasn't always nervous about crossing the border or ill at ease with tribal people. When I was a little girl, my family sometimes washed with seepies in the village of Lower Brule on the river bluffs, the drums rattling the ground beneath my feet and the singers' voices echoing over the river. I wanted to join the dancers and twirl like they did, so fast that the rhinestones on my barrette would be shooting stars. But I didn't dance. To join the circle of dancers uninvited seemed intrusive, like a Protestant standing at the communion railing in a Catholic church. My father was friends with several Native men, including Ted, a member of the Sakanju band, who worked for my father and lived with his wife Rose in a bunkhouse across the yard from us. I must have been about four years old, so my recollections may be faulty. But I see Rose chatting with my mother as the women worked in the kitchen. My father and Ted are holding pheasants in their broad hands and slicing the flesh with knives. I do remember wrapping my arms around my father's long leg, his hand ruffling my hair as he spoke a bit of Lakota with Ted. I remember the smell of mud on their boots and cigarette smoke on their jackets, the familiar sense of men and land. Despite those good memories, I began to drive roads that bypassed the reservation. At the end of the tour, I stare across the border of Pan Moon Jam at a slight North Korean soldier standing in the shadow of a building. He stares back at me, his fingers wrapped around a rifle. His pants bag at the knees and flop over the tops of his polished boots, and the sleeves of his uniform reach his knuckles. He has pulled his cap so low over his head that his ears stick out beneath the brim like handles on a jug. He looks like a child playing soldier in his big brother's uniform the way I once play, ran through our shelter belt in a fringed plastic vest with a bow and arrow, playing cowboys and Indian with my cousin. We drew straws to decide who would play which part. Being the Indian meant being the underdog, and even though it was just a game, I crept behind tree trunks, fearful of being caught in the sights of her six-shooter before I could point my arrow at her. I recognize that feeling here in the fierce yet frightened expression in the young soldier's eyes. I want to reach across the border that makes us enemies, touch his smooth face and tell, them, tell him he has nothing to fear from me. Borders, physical and imaginary, can both divide and connect people, depending upon the choices we make. In 1887, the Crooks Commission divided the Great Sioux lands into six reservations and opened up a pathway for travelers to follow. Miners came through to stake claims on the veins of gold that ran through the mountains of Paha Sapa, the Black Hills. Ranchers staked their claims on the land. Lines drawn on paper that day delineated not only the borders of those reservations, but the lives of people who would live on either side of the border in years to come. The border that runs on the diagonal across the Korean Peninsula was drawn at the end of the war in 1953. Rear Admiral Matthias Gardner reportedly paused only for moments before pointing to the 38th parallel and asking, why not put the border here? 
His impulsive decision has separated people from their families for years. Jung Hoon's father was one of those who left North Korea during the prisoner exchange at the end of the war. My father walked over the bridge of no return, he tells us, as we drink a beer after I lectured on Native American literature for his class. My father always hoped he might one day cross back over the bridge to his homeland, but of course he never did. We call it the irrevocable bridge because we can't take back some choices. He rubs the frosty mug with his thumb and wipes away the condensation, saying nothing for a moment. That was the last time my father ever saw his brother. Yet until the day he died, my father could recall every feature of his brother's face. Though I can't picture Mrs. Thompson's face, I do remember her dark eyes, the flat buttons that dangle from loose threads on her coat, and her faint smell of shampoo mixed with something fried. My friends found the smell hilarious and covered their mouths to trap their giggles as we walked by her. Although my mother often smelled of Prell shampoo and fried hamburger, I put my hand over my mouth. As I followed the girls down the sidewalk, I heard my mother say, if something makes you feel ashamed, you should not do that thing. I saw swirls of chalk dust rising between cracks and concrete. The Military Armistice Commission building is a blue and gray Quonset hut about the size of a hen house. There is a table gleaming with polish in the middle of the room. As the Korean War raged, negotiators sat at this table, arguing over who owned more inches of land beneath it. The table still straddles the invisible border that runs beneath the floor. A Republic of Korea soldier leads me over the border and into North Korea. He stands at the end of the table, spreads his legs, clenches his fists, and bends an elbow in a sharp angle over a glossy pistol in his holster. A young American man runs over to him and with an impish grin strikes the same pose while his girlfriend snaps pictures. The soldier stares ahead, eyes hidden behind reflective sunglasses. An image comes to me. I am perhaps six years old and standing in front of an old Indian man sitting on a bench outside a souvenir shop in Rapid City, South Dakota. He wears a long headdress, its feathers coated in dust. His buckskin tunic is worn, the beads chipped and loose and his leggings too short. Craters of pores cover his bulbous old man's nose. His knotted hands rest on his knees, his bones peeking through the leather. Fingers come from somewhere and tweak his nose. People laugh. I hesitate. Something feels wrong about laughing. At the same time, he doesn't seem real to me. He is simply a relic, like the arrowheads my brothers found poking up through the pasture's sod. And so I laugh. The old man doesn't flinch. He stares ahead with cloudy eyes. I feel hollow at the memory, and I'm suddenly weary and anxious for the tour to end. I cross back over the border and lean against the wall, watching people line up to have their pictures taken next to the soldier, making peace signs with their fingers. Out the window, beyond the imposing North Korean administration building, and the armed guard standing in its shadow, a patch of blue sky rises above the scorched hills of North Korea. It was a windy day in the fall of 1991 when I stood outside the Wounded Knee Cemetery on the Pine Ridge Reservation. All around me was the landscape of the Lakota. To the east, Makasika, with rainbow-tinged spires and gullies. To the north, Mathopaha, a single hill that thrusts itself from the foothills, its summit a place for prayer and visions. To the west, Paha Sapa, the heart of the Lakota Nation. To the south lies Fort Robinson, where Crazy Horse was killed. The grasses bent sideways in the wind, their feathery tops nearly touching the ground. I imagined the pounding of hooves as the cavalry rode to forts and the squeaking of metal wheels as they cut deep grooves in the sod. To the Indians standing on this hillside, the prairie schooners must have looked like clamshells strung on a giant's necklace. In the valley below, Chief Spotted Elk and his band of mini Kanju camped that frigid night in December. A cottonwood tree on a ridge was a lone sentry keeping watch over the long, deserted camp. I felt an immediacy of history in this place. Layered beneath the perfume of blue stem and prairie rose was the faint scent of gunpowder and blood. Beneath the trilling of a metal arc, the crack of Hotchkiss guns and the screams of women and children. I had come as a guest of the Oglala Lakota to honor the return of Zidkala Nuni, the lost bird, who was found lying in the snow four days after the massacre at Wounded Knee, her mother's body curled around her. I pictured a shawl wrapped around the baby, the fringes caked with her mother's blood. 
Perhaps there was a beaded turtle tied to the baby girl's dress, her umbilical cord inside, an amulet that protected her. Maybe she wore moccasins covered with stars of colored beads. Maybe she wore leather boots. St. Kala Nooney was adopted by an officer of the 7th Cavalry and taken to California. Her life of poverty and abuse was a footnote to the story of a man we called a hero who took her into his home. She died on February 14, 1920. Seven years later, she was carried back to her homeland to lie near her mother. Her grave smelled of freshly turned sod and carnations wrapped in a ribbon. The word daughter glittered on the satin. White blocks of concrete outlined the mass grave at Wounded Knee. They sank at weary angles into the dirt as if to join the bones beneath them. Weeds pushed up through the sod and poked through the chain link fence. Like the timeless landscape of Spotted Elk's camp, this untended graveyard made its history more immediate somehow, as if the shooting had just stopped, this trench dug in haste, and stones tossed onto the ground to mark the site before the soldiers rode away. That day, I was nearly as old as Mrs. Thompson was when she gave me her boots, and I still wondered what she saw in that teenage girl I didn't see in myself. She must have heard my laughter, must have seen how I averted my eyes as I walked by her. I should have been no more than an aside and small print in the story of her life. But she was a woman of Wakatunaka, a generous heart. In the Lakota tradition of the Wipila, she gave me a gift with no ex expectations, except perhaps her faith in the power of ceremony. Prayer claws tied to the fence fluttered in the wind. The pounding of drums was the heartbeat of the land, and the wind was the chance of warriors around a campfire. I closed my eyes and saw an eagle ride the thermals, carrying the people's prayers to Wankan Tonka, whose spirit resides in each of us. A man with a single braid on his back walked toward me, holding a bowl of smoldering pijahota. I tasted the earth and the burning sage, and my eyes began to tear. I waved the smoke over me. It brushed my face with soft fingers. Thank you. Questions? What town was it exactly you grew up in? I grew up in Reliance, South Dakota. Went to school in Chamberlain, but the land I grew up on was where I grew up. The land I grew up on, the land I grew up on is um, North. East of the Alliance. Do you know where Reliance is? Yeah, I'm from Wall. Oh, oh, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> She's from Phillip. Carol's from Phillip, right? Right. So, West River is the best. If you don't know the difference between <laughs> East and West River, we'd be happy to chat. Oh, oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> are, where are you from? I'm from Laverne. Oh, okay. My, mother, my mother was from Old Ridge. There you go. Can I tell a quick story about East and West River? I, my husband and I were in. Oh, sh I'm loud. All right, all right, all right. Oh, he's videotaping still. I'm sorry. My husband and I were in uh, the Hall of Tapestry in the Vatican, and it was packed. We were elbow to elbow and, you know, breast to butt. I, you couldn't move. So the guy next to me strikes up a conversation. And finally, he said, where are you from? And I said, South Dakota. Oh, he was from California. Oh, East River or West River? I said, how would you know that? He said, my daughter's from Rapid City, and she says that makes all the difference. <laughs> so it does make a difference. So it's nice to see some people from home. Yes? What inspired you to actually write the book about The book started as a travel journal. What I really thought I was writing was a story. I was going to call it Idiots Abroad. <laughs> Not Innocents Abroad, but Idiots Abroad, because my, my husband and I were very little language, just kind of bumbled our way through Korea. I mean, I don't know how we did it. And we got in a lot of fun little scrapes, not bad things, which is... But then I joined this writing group with four, including Marianne, with four you know, young women doing creative nonfiction. And they kept pushing me to write more about... Well, I, I take that back. I'll start. I wrote about going to the public baths, and I opened the chapter with a scene where my mother's sitting over the large illustrated Bible with my little brother's crayons, coloring dresses on naked women in the Bible. And they said, what? Your mother colored dresses on women in the Bible? I said, didn't your mother? <laughs> I thought everybody's mother did that. 
And they said, you know, that's really interesting. There's a story there. You need to start pulling in. Do you have other stories like that? Well, I resisted for a long time. Um, I resisted making a memoir because I didn't think my life was particularly interesting. Um, I'm kind of private, actually. You wouldn't believe that at the end of the, if you read this book, you wouldn't believe I'm private, but I am. And so it sort of evolved into this memoir, which I wasn't intending to write. When I was in Korea, though, my mother's voice, I stepped off the airport in Incheon. She was, a, she was a paranoid about illness and always afraid of being too far away from a doctor. I stepped off the airport and I ran into a woman who had a white mask, a surgical mask over her face. And I heard my mother say, oh, for Pete's sakes, there's a bird flu epidemic. Where are you going to find a doctor in this godforsaken country? I mean, I just knew exactly what she would have said if she'd seen me at that moment. And she followed me. Her voice came to me throughout Korea, but I still hadn't planned on writing that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Do you have any feedback from uh, readers of this book um, that's particularly interesting? I, a, lot of, a lot of people are saying that they, they understand that, that they can make connections with it, that um, well, mostly women my age and men my age would sort of surprise me, but I've had some younger people say they like it. Can I tell my favorite fan story? If you get a book published, be ready for whatever. So I gave the copy of the book to my daughter's babysitter, the woman who babysat her the first six, six years of her life, and I love this woman to pieces. So she wrote a very nice thank you note in which she said, you know, I read in the bathroom, and I'm getting quite a bit of the reading done. So, okay, well, that, that's nice. Well, then I ran into her about six weeks later, and she said, I haven't gotten very far. You know, I've started taking Metamucil. I just hardly spend any time in the bathroom. <laughs> I want to marry her. I love that woman. I mean, just, she just said what's there. So don't get, you don't get a big head when you get responses like that, right? I'm bathroom reading. I'm chicken soup for the soul, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> isn't that a great story? I have no pride. I'll make fun of myself. Anybody else? Yeah, Carol? I know you have Mm -hmm. and whether or not your perspective of your family mm -hmm. is the same as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So what kind of reaction did you get from your, your uh, siblings? Well, the first thing I'll say is in the process of writing, I did not let them get in my head. I did not have my mother or my four siblings over my shoulder at any time because I knew if I thought about what they were thinking, it would change the book. She knows my brothers. Jim is whatever, it's good, right? <laughs> whatever. Um, my youngest brother, Kevin, they're all three writers, by the way, so I have three brothers who are writers. He, 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 had liked the, he talked about the language. He said, you have some really graceful moments in this book. But my brother, Terry, my middle brother, said maybe the most interesting thing. He said, the book introduced me to a woman I never knew, and I thought he meant my mother. And a friend said, uh-uh, he's talking about you. He didn't know you because I didn't know the woman I saw in this book. So, and my sister, my sister really thought that I captured my mother's voice. That's what she noticed. But did they all agree that we had the same experience? No. All five of us saw a different woman. In me and her, I guess. But if you have, if you're writing and if you have, you know, siblings or friends or whatever, parents, you have to get rid of them. You cannot have them hanging over your shoulder. Now, when you go to edit it, if you're really uncomfortable, you can always take it out. But in the drafting process, keep people out of your lives, <laughs> your writing life. Don't let them hang around because they will change things, I think. Yes? When you're working on a memoir about something like this, there's so many different parts, um, history and the political situation. What's the sort of measurement of straight up memory, research, and um, inventiveness? Because I know that you know truth is a relative thing. Yeah. Something happens and that's your truth, but do you remember it exactly as it happened? Or? No, um, I, 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 I have the brown boots. I've kept them. I was 14 when she gave them to me, and I've kept them. And after I got, they, they followed me everywhere I've moved since I was married. And they're on my desk right now. So I've always kept the brown boots. So that story is true. And the story of, of um, I mean, everything, all the major things are true. But 
I, I suppose I invented, or rem I tried to, when you said that, you try to remember. What were the things that we said to each other about Native people? What, what did people say? Um, and I, I knew I couldn't describe Mrs. Thompson fully because I hate to admit this, but I can't picture her face. I do remember her coat. Um, but other things, obviously, the chalk dust in my mother's voice, that was sort of inventiveness. But, um, so that's an example of trying to remember what was it about those boots. And I didn't even know I was going to write about the, the boots until about the last six weeks I worked on this book. And all of a sudden I thought, that's what you want to write about. That's what really hits you so hard at the border. It's, it, it's um, the bo reservation borders and the ways that I wasn't very good. <laughs> And Mrs. Thompson's boots, I, I've decided, are the, are the epitome of a gift because she gave me those boots with no expectations and I hadn't earned them. And I think that's the definition of a gift. And I think the gift she gave me was someday I would grow up and be a better person. That's what I've decided. But that all came later and perhaps I've invented all of that. <laughs> Oh, I did a lot of research. We, I took tons and tons of notes in Korea. I kept a journal. I think I filled two journals. Then when I came home, though, I, had to, I did a lot of research to make sure I was right, because the language difficulties were, they were quite bad for me. I had some, a lot of trouble understanding, and I just had to go back and research. Is this really what Haho Village was? Is it really what the DMZ was like? I went back and looked up uh, information on the USO tour to make sure I had at least the, the points that we went to right. So it's a combination of research and and, and the more you write, the more things come to you, some of which is probably invented, some of which is maybe memory that's been told, and I, stories I remember that I had forgotten. I mean, who knows? Maybe a third of each. Maybe a third research, a third memory, and a third um, inventiveness. Although, at the library reading today, uh, a woman who used to teach psychology at State said that you had no memories at three because I write about remembering being in the hospital at three. She said, you didn't have that memory. You don't remember three. Um, I said, oh, okay. She said, you've heard the stories, and you've heard stories about it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But the thing that she, I thought was really interesting, she said, probably why so many memories came to you in Korea is you were a child, and all children are strangers. And when you went to Korea, you were a stranger again. And I think there's some truth to that, actually. I think that maybe was true for me, being out of the country. and. And being a stranger, not having the language of most of the people we were around, really sort of took me into a different place. I didn't answer your question very well. That's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Carol. Um, I don't know, and actually, I got to pick, I did, that is my title. Um, I didn't get to pick the cover image. I, this, I, this is like a sunset, and I know I'm in the sunset of my life, but I didn't think I wanted it on the cover of a book. But <laughs> he said he would pick the cover. He sent me several. Carol grew up even, even with fewer trees than I did, maybe. And um, he sent me the first few pictures. There were lots of trees. And I said, no, I don't want any trees on this cover. One tree, no more than one tree. And then otherwise, all, all sky and grass. So he did honor that. But it's, this is a little more of a sunset of her life sort of look that I would've, might have liked. I don't know how I came up with it. I, there's a lot about, I write about my mother as a daughter and of course myself as a daughter and I think in both her life and my life we were shaped by that landscape. Um, I tended to like it more than she did. I think she was more uncomfortable in, out in that <laughs> isolated area than I was. I loved it. I loved being far away from people. <laughs> Not as far away as you were probably, but a ways. Yeah. Where are your parents from? Pardon me? Where are your parents from? Lyman County, which is where I, my farm is. Um, my mother grew up on one side of the county and my father on the other. And they met through church, of course, Catholic. He's Bohemian, she's Irish, but you're going to have to marry a Catholic. <laughs> so they met at church in, in Reliance, at St. Mary's in Reliance. Yes? Uh, you mentioned one of your... Well, I think one, or let me think about the chapters. One was obviously my willingness to confront the story of Mrs. Thompson, to be willing to put that out. Um, 
I look back and I think there are times when I'm very insecure in this book where I express a lot of fears. Um, one of the things that happened in the process of when I lived in Korea was I was, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I had a very challenging pregnancy because my blood pressure shot way up and um, um, I was on the edge of preeclampsia, so they induced and did all sorts of things. Well, to make a long story short, um, they, I ended up, I had to have a kidney removed and they told me I couldn't have any more children. And I called a Catholic woman to tell her that. And I said, Kenneth had a vasectomy because I couldn't have any more children because it was too dangerous. Now remember, this would have been 41 years ago. And she said, hey, what? And I said, the doctor said it could be a stroke, heart attack, or worse, you know, and I can't believe he had a vasectomy. And that's the only thing she focused on. And what I had began to realize as I was working on that chapter is I would not talk about that health. When people said, why do you have only one child, I wouldn't answer that. I didn't tell the truth. I would say it just didn't happen. I could not bring myself to say, I'm unhealthy, uh, we had a vasectomy so it wouldn't happen. Uh, because of that, I just felt total rejection, total shame. And I didn't know how much I was affected by that until I started to write about that. And then I realized that really tore me apart in ways that I couldn't even acknowledge. That phone call just devastated me. And I came to understand how much it devastated me as I was writing this. Um, I think one of, the, one of the other things that maybe came, yeah, I, I can tell you another one. I have one more example. My mother really struggled with my feminism. She really did not like it. And she, we went through a pretty tough patch over that because she saw me as increasingly um, outspoken and at, you know, well, I was a feminist, and she didn't like that. And I mostly got mad at her, and I just looked at her as being not with it, and yada, yada, yada. But in writing this chapter, I began to piece together. And the more I thought about it, the more I think I understood what I was doing to my mother. I'd, grown, I'd been mad at her for what she was doing to me. And then I began to think more and more about, I get my mother. She, what she saw in my feminism was a rejection of everything that she had clung to and that had made her who she was. I was the one that was challenging her. I was the one that was getting in her face about things. And I think it really helped me understand her better, and that was really helpful. That was actually very helpful for me. We were fortunate enough, the last five or six years of her life, we really came back together. And that's when she started telling me some stories, and um, our last years were really good. That was a tough time for women, though. It's tough tough time um, for women my mother's age and then they see daughters moving into a, <laughs> a different world working and you know, you know it's kind of tough. Did that answer your question? Yes, great. Thank you. And there's others I'm sure but I never intended to go into these deep places. It's a shock to me still that I did and that I've actually published it. That just surprises me that I've allowed my, that I've opened myself up as much as I have in this book. My writing group said, this is some advice for those of you who choose to do um, memoir particularly, you have to trust the reader with your story and they have to trust you. They have to trust that you're being honest and you have to trust that they will know how to, that they will accept your story without criticism or without, you know, seeing less of you. You have to trust the reader and the reader has to trust you, which I thought was really interesting. So I tried to think of that. Yes. Could you talk about your next writing project? <laughs> Do you think I should? If you're comfortable. Um, I'm working on a book right now, and I, I'll see if I can set this up. In, in the 1950s and early 60s in South Dakota, and probably anywhere in the world actually, um, we had no concept of lesbianism. I, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know the word. Well, there was a woman in our, now remember, this is a small town. There was a woman in our town that, she was eight years older than, than I was. And we all kind of watched her transition from a, a woman into, um, she became sort of a James Dean cowboy, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I mean, she had the James Dean kind of look, but she wore cowboy boots and blue jeans, and she had a cowboy hat, and she, carry, you know, she carried a rifle in her car all the time. She had an IQ of 70, so she dropped out of eighth grade. I mean, she had no, no future. No, I mean, no potential, really, poor thing. Um, 
she fell in love with and was dating a pretty 19-year-old girl, little redhead named Jean Steppen. Jean Steppen was also dating uh, a 21-year-old man named Myron Menzi. At the same time, she took engagement rings from both of them. And I, you know, I'm not sure what all that meant, and I'll mention a little bit later about the resources. But to make a long story even longer, on Memorial Day 1962, at the, the end of my sophomore year in high school, Beverly Waugh followed Jean and Myron down Highway 16 into Chamberlain and ultimately pulled them over, came around the corner and somehow jammed him up against the curb and she got out with the 22, went over to the car and opened the car door and there was a little bit of a chat, a talk, and then finally she, said, she was saying, get out of the car, get out of the car. And finally Myron said, why should I do that? And she said, because you're engaged to her. And Jean Steppen whisk, sort of whispered, we still are, and she pulled the trigger and killed him. And there were two trials. She was convicted of murder in the first trial, and then on the appeal, for a lot of reasons. Her, her appeal case actually set precedent in South Dakota for, how, for the judge's instructions to the jury in a murder trial. Um, so she then was uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to the state hospital in Yankton. She got out after 20 years. She went back to Chamberlain. She didn't last very long. And then uh, periodically she checks herself. She learned to be a barber in, in the hospital. And periodically she checks herself back in. And then she comes out and she goes back in. She'd be in her 70s now. So I went to the courthouse in Chamberlain, because that's where the trial was, and asked if they had transcripts. And the woman said, I don't even know about this case. I'm not sure who you're talking about. And she said, but she said we destroy everything after 20 years. Well, she came back out, and she had two discs in her hand. And she said, they saved these on discs. You want to see them. So um, I was sitting there looking at it, and I came upon a disc with nothing but the love letters between Jean and Beverly. So I mean, I just have a treasure trove of information on this. But the big thing to me is just not going, in this story, if I get this done, it's not going to be salacious, and it's not really a murder story. To me, the real story is two girls from the same small town, one of whom, by accident of birth, had every possibility in the world, or at least many possibilities, and the other, by accident of birth, had none. And that's really what breaks my heart when I think about Beverly Waugh. But, and we weren't particularly nice to her, as you can imagine, as teenagers. So I have, I have a lot of guilt, Catholic guilt, just all of I mean, I feel very guilty about Beverly, but um, I, I will tell the story. I hope if I get it done, I'm hoping to tell it with such humanity because it breaks my heart when I think about her now. When I think about that relationship, it breaks my heart what happened to those three people. We'll see if I get it done. Anything else? Thank you very much. I've had a great day. I got to, st I got to teach a class today, and I said to the students, you're, you're lucky I let you out, because it's been six years since I've been in a classroom, and I just kind of wanted to keep them there all day. I was so happy to be in a classroom again. I do miss students. I miss you a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. We record all these SMSU Visiting Writers Series readings on campus, and you may access them on the SMSU English Department Facebook page to watch and share with others. The next reading in our SMSU Visiting Writers Series will be spring semester, February 2015. We do not have a date set yet, so stay tuned. Jim Zarzana, SMSU English professor, will read from his second novel, Mars Co. Triumphant, in his four-book science fiction series, The Mars Co. Saga. Thank you again, and please come outside and buy one of Mary's books and have her sign it. Thank you.